For the past couple of years, we've been seeing somewhat of an uptick in games desperately trying to be like the classic survival horror titles of yore. For better or worse. Better because while the genre never really truly died, it's certainly hard to deny it, changing to the point of it alienating many who vibe with it in the first place. And worse because, well, in its purest form, the genre just seems somewhat limiting. Angles, tankies, bad voice acting, inventory puzzles in those small Metroidvania-esque puzzle box level maps in which solving one obstacle in one part will affect another in another. It, it, it's, it's an easily downboilable formula, and so downboiled, it'll eventually become. Like again. I mean, even in the middle market and AAA sphere, shit ended up getting at least kinda samey way back when. Clock Tower 3, Haunting Ground, RE3, Silent Hill 4, Dino Crisis 3, Fatal Frame 3, while all, not you, good games in their own right, were also very trapped by the formula. Trying desperately to change by adding weird first-person spook segments, insane stories, unkillable enemies, and overall just less straight-up horror, but also all playing very much the same at their core not having changed much at all since RE1. Shit stagnated, I guess. Saturated at the very least, and what worries me is that now it'll primarily be indies taking over the helm in regards to bringing shit back for max nostalgia points, and those haven't exactly been all that amazing at not being generic. I mean, peep this. Yo! Looks like a cool game, right? Well, these is all different games, actually. Good ones, I'm sure, but definitely also very generic in a neutral, no-shade-done, monkey-see-monkey-do kind of way. And the first example of this happening with survival horror is probably Banned Memes. Developed by fellow Dutchy Noah Pau, Band Memories was a very Silent Hillish demo from 2015 that was rough but promising. It had some vibes of its own with the Asian interior design and the goofy walk cycles. It, it, it certainly got those PS1 shading and warping vibes down pretty well and seemed to interpret Silent Hill's riddle-based memory gameplay very accurately too. But since then, he's been improving and updating it and looking at these recent screenshots, it uh... Yeah, th this really is just Silent Hill 1 Part 2 in it. Again, it looks great, I will play this, but it's also exactly what I meant when I said that things finna get generic. And I realize that that's often used as a negative term, but, but that's really not what I'm doing. I'm, I'm saying it simply as a way to denote that it is very of its genre. Genre-neric. <laughs> that's where the word lies etymologically, so that's how I'm gonna use it. Like, Shovel Knight is also very of its genre. It uses tropes, visual elements, audio elements, gameplay elements, and the general ethos, vibe, and aesthetic of the 8-bit platformer, i.e. it's generic, but at the same time it's also the perfected peak of this genre, but that doesn't make it not what it is. See what I mean? And hey, for all we know, Bad Memories will be a better Silent Hill 1 than Silent Hill 1 never was too. Who knows? What we do know, though, is that the other rather similar effort by the name of back in 1995 most certainly was not. I reviewed this game when it was still very new. It, 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 it was made by a sole man from Japan named Takaki Ichijo who created it as a type of tribute to stanky old funky experimental 3D Japanese games. The Overbloods, Dr. Hausers, Trags, Chase the Expresses, Galarianses, and the Silent Hills. Though it would mostly be aiming for the former two yet was often compared to the very latter. Falsely so, I feel. People dunked on it big time at the time for its slow pacing, not scariness, general jank, weird floaty plot, lack of good puzzles, and the rampant peaks and difficulty thereof, and the shitty combat, and I, I didn't come down on it nearly as hard as many others did at the time, especially because it did resonate with me in a way it didn't fully understand yet, but I still felt the same regardless. It wasn't Silent Hill enough. Though, having since played Overblood, he, he actually nailed it. The game is about Kent, a weepy as one boy with a Logitech mic-ass voice who needs to go to a tower. 
And right off the bat, I already love this setting. You see, he can't just waltz on over to the tower across the street all casual. Nay, he needs to weasel his way like Heather going home by navigating a maze of office buildings linked together through zip lines and walkways. Said office buildings are also very uncanny, empty, and partially barred off in strange ways, with the boring carpets, slightly off-white walls, copy-pasted chairs and tables, doors that lead into nothingness, and of course, penis monsters who are there because fuck you, we needed a reason for the world to be this way. None of this is set up very well at all, the story is meta at best and virtually non-existent at worst, but it's a dope-ass setting regardless of justification. Anyway, these penis monsters aren't going to slap themselves, so that's up to you. The combat is fitting. As I said, going by the River Hill Mech Alone in the Dark handbook, the fact that the combat is god-awfully terrible, in an easy, barely even there, unobtrusive kind of way, is exactly how it'd be, as you'll mostly be left to just explore and do puzzles. The only thing is, is that in, say, Overblood, the puzzles were quite varied and also the story was quite a large feature, with many fully voice acted cutscenes. Yet, back in 1995, we only had like three or four actually voiced scenes all lasting seconds each and were left with notes and text dumps otherwise, so shit wasn't exactly compensating for the shitty combat much. However, the puzzles are all keypads with riddles resulting in numbers, so you know that shit's varied. Honestly, as a game with just like the gameplay, it, it, it's a little bit boring. The story is barely there, it doesn't really have any actual characters, the puzzles suck, the combat sucks, and while the patches made sense made it so that the enemies attack you now, there being one whole non-keypad puzzle, and there being some shitty filters, overlay, and a 3DS version that I'm too lazy to grab footage of, the game is still piss easy and not exactly the height of entertainment. But there is very much a purpose to the shitty filters, although they be, being that you're playing this on a shitty CRT. As if a kid uncovering this weird ass PS1 game that you know nothing about, where things start glitching out, with full on hideo segments and proper fuck ups leading to Kent passing out. Right up until the very end, where the game breaks down entirely with Kent killing himself. Forgive me, Alyssa. It's all over now. Weird fonts start happening, the resolution and filters are dropped, the overlays break, the texture warp gets booted, and suddenly you get a direct brain drain from Takaki himself, talking about how the game isn't meant to be fun, that it's supposed to supersede gameplay and give you the experience of playing something weird, experimental, and obscure, as you would have back in 1995. What he wants you to do as well is reflect upon that time, and where you'd want to see games go in the future. All the while you're walking around this weird ass beta test unused concepts realm with Tal based Silent Hill 1 lighting. And as someone who grew up with a chipped PS1 and dumpster dived into the deep end many a times playing all sorts of strange uncoverings, sometimes in languages foreign to me, I can certainly dig the vibes of fuckton. At the same time though, the big within walls reveal is that Kent is stuck in the past in 1995 to be exact. And the whole symbolically killing himself and waking up reborn only to slowly reject the Silent Hill rehash of the game he and you just experience entirely reads as a commentary on the blatant nostalgia baiting that this game was advertised as. Like the first initial trailers and with quotes like, do you remember the tank control? Or as you know, the player's health is shown in the menu screen, right? And whoa, hey, the in-game font changes to that very same trailer font and reads you this. I gaze at my memories through rose-tinted glasses. The better times I long for will remain misinterpreted, deep inside me, as long as they're not forgotten. Even if I try to reclaim my innocence to start over from the beginning, the truth is that I will always be stuck in the past. The scenery, there was nothing special about it. Everything was just new to me, filled with wonder, nothing more. To chase that illusion is to move backwards. I've simply grown old, that's it. I can never go back to the way things were. 
So uh, I, I, I guess he deliberately tried to MGS2 this bitch by setting it up as one thing while in fact serving as more of a critique of it. Exaggerating the texture warp, the shitty combat, and the bad flat lighting of these old PS1 ass games only to break them down in the end, as you get schooled on, both in that I get you fam sort of way and in the way that I'm trying to do with this very video. Fitting, huh? It, 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 it's almost like I planned this. So, here my ass was, following Takaki on Twitter when suddenly he starts retweeting some dope-ass shit. Some stuck-in-the-past shit. Some straight-up RE1 shit. Some goddamn shit. That's some shit shit. Was a game called Vaccine that on the outset seemed to be to resi what 1995 was to Silent Hill. Being that everyone assumed it was just going to be like that whilst not being like that at all. Vaccine, you see, might look the part, but actually isn't an old school survival horror game, as it is instead a randomized, timed, rogue thing, where you do runs as you would in Isaac. In this case, trying to mansion to find a cure and pray to fucko that you can get the right weapon and healing drops as to not horribly fuck yourself. It's a great ass twist on paper, I will admit, taking the panic of RE1 yet stripping away the backtracking, memorization and speedrunnable tactics, leaving only the pure anxiety as the mansion changes around you on each run. Never having certainty or bearings or safety. Pure survival. Pure horror. Pure, actually kind of frustrating. Thing is, you die like really fast, as you did in RE1. Only in RE1 you could be like, okay, fine, I'll try it like this now, and set out with a new plan. Which is where the satisfaction came from. Just being able to make it to a safe room, dumping your shit after a successful track out into the hostile as fuck mansion, then opening up your map, covering your itinerary with a new set of possibilities and rooms you may or may not have just unlocked. And vaccine don't roll that way because everything random. The stakes remain as hostile but the reward never comes, as you can't really plan or prepare for much of anything, constantly getting screwed over by unforeseeable odds. And I get it, that's just how roguelikes be, I'm not at all a fan of those so I can't actually say how well this stacks up to say Binding of Isaac or Rogue Legacy, but for my money I don't feel that it's balanced very well to make it satisfying in its own way. Kind of like they just dump the roguish elements into RE1 without really considering how to make it work properly. Unless, of course, I'm missing something. It, 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 it does look bloody fucking amazing, though. More so than any other indie effort, this legit looks like a PS1 game with pre-renders. The music is also the most resi ass thing ever, and aside from the menus being kind of dumpy, it fucking nails the aesthetic absolutely. With that glossy, shiny lighting bouncing off of the textures in that 90s 3D marble-esque shading sort of way. It very much does things to my soul. But at the same time, I also feel that shit's somewhat wasted on a game that moves too fast for one to stand still and appreciate it. Though there is a lot of potential here. If these people could get some actual writers on board and tweak this formula up, or try something different altogether, they could for sure use these visuals to make an RE1 Part 2, with or without a twist. Human Entertainment were probably one of the most underrated yet simultaneously influential developers of the 1990s. Suda51's games, Danganronpa, EDF, Way of the Samurai, and Zero Escape all came from the house that Human built. Being that when they disbanded in 2000, many of its prolific figures went on to make studios of their own. And when they were still there, they were making anything from what could very well be one of the first fully 3D open world games in the form of Mazerna Falls, highly story-driven yet super interactive horror games by way of the Twilight Syndromes, to insane wrestling games with suicidal subplots and the big international smash hit that was the Clock Tower series. At the helm of which set one Hifumi Kono, who much like everyone else also eventually formed his own studio called Nude Maker, who uh, surprisingly only appeared to have made one hentai game. 
as they typically would do contracted work for companies like Capcom for whom they made the Steel Battalion series. Weirdly enough though, when Capcom up and swooped the Clock Tower license from Human's Ashes, they didn't contact Nude Hifumi and instead made shit in-house. I don't know if this was ever a sore point or not, but it must have been some type of strange to see your baby being taken from you like that and so in the old year of 2015, Mana launched a Kickstarter for Nightcry aka Clock Tower by way of Mighty Number no. Beastain, which started off pretty promising as well, with some big ass names fully on board, like Shinji Mikami of Resident Evil 4, God Hand and Vanquish fame, Kiichiro Toyama, the director of Silent Hill 1, The Siren series and Gravity Rush, Koji Igarashi of Castlevania and Bloodstained, Fumito Ueda of Eco, Colossus and Bird Cat Dog, and many, many others, all giving it their support and blessing in that classic thumbs up to that gameplay footage, special thanks in the credits section fashion. But moreover, it also had Takashi Shimizu, the director of the Grudge movies involved with its initial concept, writing and co-direction. Masahiro Ito, aka Twitter God, aka Young BDSM, aka the artist for all of the Team Silent Silent Hill games doing the enemy design, a whole host of Konami Gulag SKPs composing the music, and a ton of other big-ish names like Platinum and Tango Gameworks' animator or the designer of Sonic Unleashed, Steel Battalion 2, and various Tekken games also being on board as a creative advisor, and least of all, Barry fucking Burton doing a voice role. And with all of this push, all of this backing, all of this pedigree and momentum, they went and produced a game with zero music, no voice acting, horrible animation, a terrible plot that goes nowhere, very shallow characters, and gameplay that's quite far off on the tedium spectrum. It sure is hot in here. Could you take my jacket? <laughs> oh my god, bro, look at that fucking thing. Yeah, the night cry, it, 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 it kind of sucks. Not in a way where it's wholly charmless. I, I could certainly see it getting a cult following over time, one I may perhaps even be a part of, but it is for sure way too jank, repetitive, and tedious for its own good. The cutscenes, though, do have that uncanny but funny deadly premonition mech PS2 vibe all over them, which I fucking adore. Huh. I have a question. Please, go ahead. What exactly are you doing? Oh, this? A passenger asked me to dispose of this dirty dress. Uh, how fun. Yes, it's fun. Okay. That shit's legit great. It's just that there ain't much of it due to most of the game consisting out of awkwardly roaming about a ship, an island, and more ship, as you play as titties, granddad, and a suicidal girl with anxiety issues game what the fuck why you getting all deep on me all of a sudden. It also has some pretty great atmosphere with loads of really bizarre and odd unexplained shit happening for seemingly no reason like creepy granny in elevator. Though, as stated, while it has an interesting enough setup, you can feel the corners being cut all over. Barry's voice actor is credited as voicing this guy for instance, yet whenever he speaks... Silence. The Kickstarter barely even made it, so I, I can get that they didn't have much money to make shit. And they wanted it to be a simple mobile game as well, yet people kept egging him on to make it a console or PC release, and so now here we are. With a game that simply just isn't very fun to play. The old man's chapters are pretty alright, using more fleshed out puzzle sequences, less instant death traps around every corner and more zany hijinks. But as far as the boat goes, which is most of the game, the scissor child ain't scary, the puzzles aren't engaging, the general gameplay loop of constantly getting interrupted by lengthy chase sequences is draining, and the controls is shitty. You see, Clock Tower was very different from traditional survival horror being that the point and click and no combat, only allowing you to defend yourself through contextual prompts and dying pretty much instantly upon fail. Shit worked at the time, but even then these weren't exactly the smoothest games to play. They were slow 
kind of awkward and in case of ghost head also just not very good. At Nightcry, instead of taking that and building upon it to make it smoother and more exciting, instead wallowed in the past and left shit exactly as is. And as a result, it mostly doesn't play well. 3D HD with a dynamic camera and the need to click on exact pixel perfect prompts as to not die in one hit do not a good match make. Nor is it exactly very clear what the game expects from you, so for better or worse this is the old school clock tower game it was meant to be. Just as stilted, goofy, awkward, charming, slow, tedious and frustrating as even its best entries often were. Just as you remember it. Luckily for us though, this wouldn't be the only title trying to bring back the fading memories of Clock Tower. Stormind Games, a team from Italy, came out swinging with an equally ambitious vision, as they too would recruit Nobuko Toda from the Konami Gulags to do the music as she did for Nightcry, only now you would actually be hearing a lot of it. There would also be voice acting in the hokey yet cinematically sound cutscenes. They would even get Keiichiro Toyama's aka Siren Hill Rush Man's blessing as well, stating that he would want to work with them, not to mention that the writer-director of this game just so happened to be the fucking concept art designer for Nightcry, so uh, yeah. Remothered Tormented Fathers was its name and upping industry legends by actually trying to innovate was its game. This is not bogged down in point and click, it is fully in third person and uses the same super functional modern control scheme as any other current game. Hiding spots are also smooth contextuals now and not those slow and awkward to trigger little cutscenes. The fact that you can use distractible items d-pad sub weapon style is also a fucking strong addition, not to mention that you can loot and search for these items which makes the world feel a lot more interactable and the enemies much more dealable. There's also modern stealth elements like being able to crouch which makes a ton of sense. There's also door opening mechanics so one doesn't just waltz into these motherfuckers Fiona style. You can take a few hits now as well which alleviates a lot of tedium and best of all it doesn't have this stagnant ass chased or not chased binary. The threat is constant, not in your face but looming. Like Mr. X was in the Resi 2 remake. I mean, you can hear stomps and screams and see and hear evidence of the scary people walking around the mansion. The shit's super tense and big engage and doesn't fall into the trap of it getting super tedious or draining by having them be these unstoppable, constantly pup opable forces of fuck. Not that it's never not that. When you have AI based enemies that run around a level, you will naturally end up in situations where they'll walk off only to then immediately come back thus needlessly perpetuating a situation, but that's just part of the genre and not really this game's fault at all. Besides, it makes it super suspenseful when combined with the scarce save stations and the limited healing capabilities being that the damage that you do take doesn't auto heal. Stakes is high, but rewards is big pretty much. Basically, though, Nightcry didn't just not look at the competition, i.e. Outlast or Amnesia and how those changed the game, but it straight up didn't even built upon the streamlining brought by Haunting Ground or Clock Tower 3, yet Remothered certainly does. This just feels like a proper sequel, picking up where those games left off, even tonally with its setting, the darker European atmosphere and theatrical performances, it's all spot on. It isn't afraid to show its influences otherwise either. It, it, it kicks off with the most Rule of Rose ass theme I've heard since Rule of Rose for one. The main character clearly is supposed to be Silence of the Lambs Lady as well. And of course it plays like a modern haunting ground. What's good about this though is that it isn't wallowing in these influences or pandering purely for nostalgia points. It's only using them to establish exactly the right tone, which doesn't feel very in the honestly. Not that it's going full on by hardcore modern standards, but it definitely looks like it could have been a late PS360 title that went under the radar. Like, there's cutscenes all over the place, the lighting and color contrasts are great, the locales and faces are expertly rendered and detailed, the music is amazing, and even the writing and voice acting are pretty alright. There is no Jennifer! You thought I was stupid, didn't you, Mr. Felton? Do you 
Do you really think I'd come here without knowing what I'm Who talking are about? You? And why did you come here? Did you come to my home to threaten me with your condescending Threatening tone? you? So maybe I should ask your wife then. She's not home. Seems like she is. This game does not fuck around, which is a vibe made evident by how elegantly oppressive the atmosphere is at all times. Anyway, you play as Rosemary Reed on her way to Old Man Felton to look into his mysterious illness and the disappearance of his daughter. She suspects there to be some shit behind this appearance, and upon arrival, shit is exactly what she'll find. Oh no! From there, it goes into all kinds of bizarre ass unexpected directions involving one of the coolest monster designs since Pyramid Head and many a mystery, note, and cutscene that make the story tons of fun to see unfold. Honestly, the only real downside to the game as a whole is that the lootables, limited inventory, and chase interruptions will discourage you from checking everything. Which wouldn't have been all that bad on its own as it certainly makes the game feel very urgent, but the plot relevant items and interactables won't be highlight signposted pre-rendered style. They will not stand out in any which way, meaning that you can easily miss objectives and run around like a head ass chicken unknowing of what to do in the dark, detailed mansion. It feels like a minor design oversight, but that's also really it. Otherwise, it's honestly kind of a masterpiece that does the old game callback really very right. Genres don't die. Adventures died after Grim Fandango came out with a bloated budget and pretty much amazing everything, yet sold like shit. Even though only a few years after Grim Fangini, Japanese developer Singh stood up and innovated the point and click drastically by focusing on dialogue parsing and legit sleuthing over moon logic and inventory with their seminal no one remembers it glass rose. And would soon built upon this with another code and hotel motherfucking dusk. At the same time, the ashes of Dr. Hauser and Overblood gave way to their writer-director Akihiro Hino founding level 5 and kicking up the Professor Layton series, and Phoenix Wright also got its shit going at Capcom, as did this wee little dev called Telltale who would also go on to drastically innovate the genre. And all that is without mentioning the hordes of Eurojank devs pumping out the crispest pre-renders and hardcore puzzles this side of fuck this game is hard. All while the genre was supposedly dead. Uh, of course it didn't die, the focus simply went from American devs and their admittedly shitty puzzles and towards Japanese devs, Telltale and Eurojank boys with many a story driven aspirations focusing solely on how to make all dialogue all interesting. The genre had changed pretty much, and with it those who liked what it was before the change partially alienated. These people over time would start pining for the olden days, wanting things to be more traditional again, all the way up to where we are now with them taking matters into their own ass by making tons of very straightforward classic adventure style indie games. Now, I ain't saying that this traditionalism is bad in any way. It, it can be a bit pig-headed, maybe, depending on how you approach it, as traditionalism kind of is in general. But what I am saying is that this isn't always the most forward-thinking headspace to be in. Sure, sometimes progression means taking a few steps back to see if we took a wrong turn somewhere, but it, it ain't exactly how most people be, let's be honest. So now, drawing this back to survival horror, a genre that had also died being that it went away from the tankies, angles and puzzles and towards either action, escapages or all atmosphere, and now primarily being handled by western indie studios rather than those from Japan land, we're also seeing people pining for the good old days. Though, as highlighted so far, the two Japanese games weren't exactly cutting it. One was a meta commentary on exactly this process, and the other drowned in its own nostalgia, thus ironically putting the onus of the proper progressive step back in the hands of some Italians and some Spaniards turning shit into a roguelike. But there would be one other. Well, there would be loads actually, depending on your definition of survival horror, but, but this one got a ton of requests, so... 
Lost in Vivo promoted itself with PS1 box art, had a graphical style inspired by early 3D games, and is made by someone going by a fake Japanese name which I think means devil killer, but is actually in first person, i.e. it's not keeping up the pretense that survival horror can only be when you can do this. It is very much inspired by Silent Hill though, like, like actually. The breathing, pulsating music, the title screen, the texture work, the inclusion of combat, which is actually very condemned -y simply because of first person. Only it's all filtered through the eyes of a Steam horror game. Steam horror referring to literally 90% of all horror games on Steam. Your Lazarados, Bendy's, Home Sweet Homes, and I'm Scared's. They all kinda play the same and look the same cause of Unity's lighting and Vivo ain't no different. Honestly, it looks uh, kinda inconsistent artistically. Like, half pixel textures, half modern realistic, half PS1, half condemned. Shit's odd, but I can't say I really dislike the vibes either. Especially once it gets some really creative visual effects going. Shit's also quite scary because of jump scares, which aren't really my thing, but it does work. I will say as well that it including combat, a thematically dense plot and actual puzzles makes it more than just a steam horror game, and the slow gradual descent into deeper and danker sewer based madness is for sure some type of ruin. Overall, the game kinda plays like a collage of Silent Hill's best moments of mindfuckery, with it pulling things like giving you the idea that you're followed while crawling around a tight tunnel, or by showing you tons of fucked up shit in cages, only to show the final cage to be broken open right before the entrance of another spooky hallway. Or, you know, just some shoes hanging out by the train tracks, some genuinely strong themages and easter eggage, but then also this. Fuck you for that one, game, but, but unfuck you for being paced super well and knowing exactly when to show what and when to cool the fuck down so you can build up your tension again with the excellent dynamic music. Not to mention it adhering to that classic Silent Hill structure with the maps and the sorta kinda puzzle dungeons, it's legit pretty fucking strong. Simple of a game though it be. Hmm. I, I, I see now why, why this was recommended to me. In either case, while fully banking on nostalgia will lead only to disappointment and stagnation, you can certainly switch back to the past looking to improve it. Not simply continuing traditions, but taking what worked and putting it in new and interesting contexts. Which honestly has been happening since RE4 came along and changed everything or during the waves of indies that spawned in the early 10s, but it is certainly pretty neat to see the classics that started all getting so much love again. A few shoutouts go to indie devs like Puppet Combo who release a metric fuck ton of games all in PS1 aesthetic with really varied takes on what survival horror as a genre can be, sporting everything from babysitting gone wrong to oh shit family. It's killer nuns. And also games like Paratropic getting mad trippy with the PS1 shit, Faith doing the genre Atari style, Helltown going full happy town cult, and many, many more like Shadow Corridor, which, which I don't even know what the fuck this is, but I mean goddamn look at it. All of these take the genre in new and exciting directions and art style honestly making them more of a return to form to me than any game specifically harkening back to any older title in particular, if set form had really ever truly gone anywhere, but then these ain't the type of games people think about when they say survival horror is back, so hence the selection for this video and the quotation marks in the thumbnail. Bitch.